Fireflies Festival of Ideas. Um, I see that people are still coming in, um, but I think it's probably good to, to get started. We have uh, quite a lot of uh, exciting ideas, I know, encapsulated in the, the books we're celebrating tonight, albeit in a slightly unconventional way. Uh, the celebratory element is, is a purely intellectual element, but I think no, no less rewarding uh, for that. Um, the panel tonight uh, is really designed to celebrate two important uh, publications. Um, the first one, uh, which we're going to hear about, is Islam on Campus, Contested Identities and the Culture of Higher Education in Britain. Uh, and that's by Alison Scott Bauman, uh, Matthew Guest, Shurak Naguib, uh, Surya Cheravalil, Contractor, Aisha Phoenix. Um, and then after that, we will be hearing uh, from Professor Tariq Madud uh, on his latest book, which is a collection of essays on secularism and multiculturalism. Um, my name is Peter Mori. I'm the uh, chair for this session. Um, and I would very much invite you to uh, listen closely to the papers and to add any questions uh, or comments that you might have in the Q&A function, which hopefully you can see at the bottom of your screen. Um, what we'll do is we'll begin with um, the, the first book that I mentioned there, um, Islam on Campus, and hear from our three speakers. And I'll perhaps introduce those one by one. Um, and then after that, we'll hear from um, Tariq Madud uh, about his new book. Um, I don't think there's anything else by way of housekeeping. I'm very excited and interested to, to hear, um, having had a very small sneak preview of um, the material that's been presented uh, in these books. And it really is very, very interesting and, and very timely as well. So without further ado, we'll move on to uh, introductions. I'll say a little bit uh, about Islam on campus first, although obviously the speakers can, can talk to it with more authority. Islam on campus is the result of five years research by a team of academics funded by the AHRC, and it builds on the work that um, they were all doing actually previously in, in different um, ways. Uh, it's based on ethnographic fieldwork, 140 hours of interviews and focus groups at six campuses in the UK. Um, and it deals with online responses to surveys by over 2000 students uh, from actually a wider group of 132 universities um, and various other media through which um, responses have been gleaned. Um, and one of the things the book is trying to do, I think, is to analyse discrimination and its impact on students and staff and the current state of Islamic studies understood broadly um, within higher education. Um, and I think it's, it's an interesting book, not least because of the, the moment uh, that it captures, which is a moment in the last five years when various narratives about nation belonging, inclusion, exclusion, integration, seem to have hardened. So as a snapshot of um, Muslim students in Britain and the experiences they undergo, and also as a, as a book with some real offerings for how to improve dialogue and improve intercultural understanding, it really is very timely. So I'd like to invite the, our first speaker, um, Matthew Guest, to come and talk a little bit about that. Um, Matthew Guest is professor in the sociology of religion and Department of Theology and Religion at Durham University. His research has focused on the institutional context that frame the possibilities of religious expression within Western contexts, including congregations, families, and universities. And since 2009, he's been researching how institutions of higher education in the UK shape the status and influence religious identities, including the impact of the university experience of Christian and Muslim students in the changing role of university chaplains. And he's the co-author of Christianity and the University Experience, Understanding Student Faith from 2013, and of course, of Islam on campus, which is what he's going to talk uh, to us uh, about tonight. So um, over to you, Matthew. Thank you, Peter. Um, it's really a great opportunity uh, this evening for us to celebrate the launch of this book that we've been working on for um, must be six years now. Um, and um, the book has been published just a few days ago. 
So we look forward to receiving our complimentary copies and hope that others will, will have uh, a time to read and enjoy the, uh, the volume when it arrives uh, in their local bookstores. Um, this is a, a long time coming in the sense that we've been working on this for some time and it really uh, started out as a um, endeavor intended to respond critically to a tendency within public discourse about Islam. And that was really um, something that uh, we were concerned about and we wanted to explore through an academic volume and through some empirical research. Um, to put things into context, there, there were a series of events that occurred um, around eight to 10 years ago that um, really sparked our concern, uh, particularly about the ways in which political agendas were increasingly shaping uh, the life of university campuses. Um, the segregated seating authority, um, controversy in 2013 at UCL um, raised the potential tensions between uh, the rights of religious groups versus um, various uh, equality agendas. Um, we were alarmed to hear various speeches by politicians which following terrorist incidents um, were keen to point out elements of risk and radicalization on university campuses across the country. And of course, we were concerned about the development of the prevent strategy and its intention to address radicalization across um, various public bodies. And in between uh, conceiving the project and receiving the funding to do it, uh, the Counterterrorism and Security Act was passed in 2015, which was uh, an increased concern given that it effectively mandated um, mass surveillance of the higher education sector um, in the interests of um, making it a more secure environment, um, even though we were concerned it might well um, do the opposite. Um, so we were concerned with the securitization of Islam within public policy discourse, um, especially that about higher education, um, and really wanted to ask what is this doing to university life and how are universities reinforcing or resisting emerging stereotypes about Muslims, including stereotypes have to do with violence and aggression, but also that are associated with uh, particular understandings of scholarship, particular understandings of gender, and also particular understandings of what constitutes um, uh, Islamic identity in uh, popular culture. So to locate the research, um, we really want to sit this within scholarship on Islamophobia, on securitization of Islam, but also within a series of books and, and publications that have emerged pretty much since the Brown um, Review of 2010, which introduced the more marketized version of the higher education sector as we know it. Um, books that address critically the changing status of the university as a site for fostering critical thought, for speaking critically into public spheres, and for sustaining an educational experience that's culturally inclusive. And we were concerned about these um, broader processes that might well be compromising the capacity of the higher education sector to achieve those um, ideals. So Islam on Campus, Contested Identities and the Culture of Higher Education in Britain, um, result of six years research um, by um, authors who are represented here this evening, Alison Scott Bowman, myself, Sharuk Naguib, but also um, Saria Sharuvalil Contractor, Aisha Phoenix. And also we should note, um, note our uh, colleagues, uh, Dr. Yen Lee and Dr. Tarek uh, Al Baghal, who both uh, contributed to the analysis of the data we collected. Um, this is the first nationwide study of perceptions of Islam and Muslims uh, within the UK university sector. And it also sits alongside a report that we've produced entitled Islam and Muslims on university, on UK university campuses, perceptions and challenges, which is freely available online. 
and which focuses much more on the survey analysis of the national questionnaire study that we incorporated into the research for this project. Um, you've already heard about the research that we've done. Uh, the survey covers 132 campuses. Um, the more qualitative field work covered six campuses, including two uh, Muslim higher education colleges. Uh, we spoke to 253 university staff and students across those campuses in interviews and focus groups. And we learned a huge amount about the experiences of Muslims and their um, treatment and um, uh, status within the context of higher education in Britain. Um, what this study really tries to do is offer an examination of what it means for Muslims to be the UK higher education's cultural other. Um, what does this mean for the lives of Muslim staff and students? And what does it mean for the role of universities in challenging prejudice, teaching critical thinking, and balancing full and frank debate with religious and cultural inclusivity? Um, I'll leave it to my colleagues to talk through some of the more uh, striking findings and their implications. Um, and uh, hand over at this point to my colleague, Shuruk. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Uh, I think the host has disabled my video. Hello. Um. Oh, hello, I'm not sure what's happened to uh, your visuals there, yes. you're, you're back on. Nigi, would you like me to introduce you? I feel you haven't been introduced properly. <laughs> okay, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, yes, I should <clears throat> I, I should have introduced you before, really, I suppose. Um, Shuruk Nigi, uh, another uh, author of this fantastic book, um, received her PhD in Islamic studies from the University of Manchester in the Department of Middle Eastern Studies. Um, her research covers classical and modern Quranic hermeneutics, and she's written on ritual purity, metaphor in, in post-classical Quran interpretation and Arabic rhetoric, feminist hermeneutics of the Quran, and contemporary female exegetes and jurists in Islam. She's associate editor of the Encyclopedia of the Quran Online and co-author of the book about which we'll hear more now. Thank you, Shuruk. Thank you very much for this uh introduction. Uh, I would like to zoom in on some of the emerging issues that Matthew hinted uh, toward. Um, as you have mentioned, I'm interested in the field of Islamic studies. This is the field uh, in which I train and which I continue to work with uh, uh, increasingly broadening interest in, uh, the, in its uh, interdisciplinarity and in how it relates to other fields. Uh, but through the Islam on Campus project, uh, one of the important spheres in which we wanted to understand perceptions of Islam was uh, in the classroom amongst those who teach and study about Islam and Muslim staff and students. And one of the, uh, one of the important intersections that um, came out of, uh, of our uh, research, one that I expected but not as powerfully uh, as it has come through, which is the intersection of uh, questions about Islamic studies and questions about gender. So gender was one of our themes. And uh, we had four themes, uh, as my colleague outlined, and I was thinking that the themes will intersect, uh, but I didn't expect them to converge in the uh, in the encounters and experiences that we uh, we had daily on campus, so uh, just to uh, perhaps give you a snapshot of uh, some of the um, of the findings, so to speak, uh, with regard to Islamic studies and its convergence uh, with gender, in in the sense that it is. Uh, gendered on campus in everyday iteration of the study of Islam in the reception of knowledge about Islam. Uh, two ways uh, I have come across in terms of how Islamic studies is gendered. One is uh, the study of Islam and Muslims seems to be uh, heavily uh, involved in the propagation of reductionist stereotypes 
still focused on women, despite all the post-colonial critiques that have uh, attempted to unpick uh, this kind of uh, neo-Orientalism. But worse than that, the study of uh, Islam and Muslims on some of the campuses where there are specialized departments, uh, which may have gone beyond the typical Orientalist stereotypes, there are certain assumptions uh, about Muslim women as learners, which are reductive in the, uh, in the immediate, in the embodied experience of learning. So one, uh, one example that I would like to share with you is about a female student from Pakistan who identified as Sunni Muslim, who attended a class in Quranic studies taught by uh, a, 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 a European trained philologist. And um, in her encounter uh, with the, with the uh, teacher in the class uh, on an MA course, uh, she only came across authors from non-Muslim backgrounds on the reading list. And when she contested the Eurocentricity of the course uh, or the reading list, the uh, academic, uh, male uh, white Christian academic uh, explained that Muslims do not want to engage with questions of historicity. And she uh, retorted back, uh, you know, there is a billion Muslims across the world and not one of them has kind of engaged with the questions of historicity. This has left her feeling that there's a sense of uh, in which the Muslim subject, the Muslim mind is being reduced and that limits her ability to engage with the knowledge in the classroom. And that knowledge is actually shaping her identity, her subjectivity. And Comparing that to another class on gender in which the teacher is uh, non-European, uh, non-white, and uh, who teaches a gender course where the reading list is mostly drawing on non-Muslim, uh, on Muslim writers, Arab writers, uh, and uh, mostly female writers as such, the student felt that finally I was given agency through the knowledge that I was experiencing and encountering in the classroom. So two very different experiences uh, by one Muslim student, uh, a female student, in which Islam is uh, constructed in her classroom, uh, or Muslims are constructed in her classroom as incapable of critical historical thinking, and another classroom in which she felt that Muslim women particularly are capable of producing knowledge and, um, and having agency, and that she felt she has agency uh, in, uh, in the sense that uh, as a student, she could see role models on her reading list. Uh, but it's not just a question of pedagogy, uh, and it's not just a question of discourses about Islam and Muslims, uh, which continue to rehash some of the uh, old, tired, Orientalist um, uh, stereotypes, uh, ones that seem to be paradigmatic, because in our survey data, we found that two out of five students across national campuses consider Muslim women who are markedly or visibly Muslim to be oppressed uh, within their traditions. Uh, an aspect of Islamic studies or of the gendering of Islamic studies uh, on our campuses, which uh, one that is less talked about, is uh, in the institutional hierarchies which maintain women at the uh, lower echelons of the uh, of Islamic studies, where you still find that the top male professors in subjects constituted or considered within the field as core Islamic studies, Islamic studies proper, so to speak, uh, they are mostly occupied and led by uh, by uh, male Muslim academics or uh, or non. Uh, Muslim uh, white uh, academics, male academics as well. Uh, and we've analyzed curricula as well. And so actually only 30% of all post holders in the UK within Islamic studies broadly defined are women academics and they occupy the lower echelons of the field. This is reflected in, uh, and not, uh, not unsurprisingly, uh, this is uh, reflected uh, in the curriculum and the modules that are being taught on Islam and Muslims in which we find gender marginalized 
in the core subjects of Islam, and that most of the females or female academics who are teaching within core Islamic uh, study subjects are working within uh, the uh, are working uh, on teaching languages or supporting uh, the core subjects through auxiliary subjects uh, uh, in um, in linguistic training or language training. So the status. Uh, and condition of the study of Islam and Muslims uh, has two uh, converging hierarchies, one discursive and one institutional, and they, uh, uh, they limit the horizons of the female agent, whether a student in the classroom or a female academic. And in both cases, the, uh, the possibility of a, uh, of a decolonization of Islamic studies rests on introducing a stronger gender lens and analysis into the field, both in the teaching in the classroom that uh, draws on the work of women, but also uh, in, in terms of uh, not just the knowledge, but also the institutional structures in which Muslim women find themselves. So a decolonization of Islamic studies, if we were to use that term, uh, will have to turn on uh, the dismantling of the gender hierarchies within the field. Thank you. Thank you, Shura. Um, um, a lot of thought-provoking ideas in there and, and things you've discovered, which I'm sure we want to, we want to come back to. Um, we'll move straight on to uh, Professor Alison Scott Bowman, who is Professor of Society and Belief and Associate Director of Research at SOAS in Impact and Engagement. Um, she and her team have, have recently completed this project. It was a three-year AHRC-funded project analysing these representations. And this is really only one part of a, of a tremendous body of work on free speech on campus, on securitisation. That's only just in, in its recent iterations. Um, she has broadcast on Radio 4, she's written for The Guardian, she's written for other higher education blogs and, and, and other outlets as well, and also gave evidence to the Joint Committee on Human Rights about free speech on campus, in two, and in 2019 was invited to uh, Downing Street to brief advisors on her research findings. Um, so Alison really is, is at the forefront of this work and, and has been for several years, and I've been very uh, lucky to benefit from her scholarship and from her collegiality uh, over over that uh, time. So I'd like to ask Alison now to uh, give us her um, money's worth on this fantastic new book. Hi, thank you. Um, you can hear me, you can't see me. Can you see me now? <laughs> Good evening, everybody. I can see myself on a small screen, not on a large, but that's fine because I know what I look like. Good evening, everybody. It's lovely to be here. This, as, as we've heard already, this is, this is about a six year journey. In 2013, I began to wonder whether there were risks attached to general atmosphere in society as a whole, which were, was leading to a chilling of speech on campus. And I wondered also if this might have a discriminatory even a racist element to it. So by 2014, I'd completed a draft, I'd created this brilliant team of amazing academics. And uh, in 2015, when the Counter-Terror and Security Act was brought in, um, as Matthew said, we also started our project. And that was very complex because the minute we started to enter campuses to talk to people about Islam, they asked us the million dollar question, are you associated with the PREVENT program? And we were happy to say, no, absolutely not. We are um, neutral, objective uh, observers. But this did mean that there were some people who thought that our work was worth proceeding with, but they would not like to be part of it. We could talk about that later if you want to hear more. But in order to conclude what has been already a, quite a rich um, diet for you, there are three terms I would like to cover. There are three negative terms, and I will discuss them briefly and then give positive responses, which we believe are part, an integral part of our research findings. So the first term is democratic deficit. The second term is epistemic injustice. And the third term is hermeneutics of suspicion. 
democratic deficit first. It did seem extraordinary to us in our work of ethnography, class and observations, um, uh, interviews and focus groups, it seemed extraordinary what the high level of ignorance there was on campus about government actions in the university sector. And this is particularly marked at that point in time because of PREVENT. Very few students understood it. Um, clearly, they had not been uh, invited to consider what they thought about it. And I'm talking now, obviously, not only of Muslims, I'm talking about all students. And there were also issues around, which I could talk about later, if you like, about the Charity Commission inviting student unions to be very cautious about what uh, discussions could focus upon in terms of international politics. So this democratic deficit seemed it was almost invisible until you actually started talking to people on campus going about their daily lives. The solution we would propose would be that universities need to stand up for an active enabling of freedom of speech, not as a libertarian right-wing populist knee-jerk reaction, but as a considered approach, which would facilitate debate and discussion about difficult issues, controversial matters. To give you a specific example, we realized that issues around Israel-Palestine couldn't be discussed, but we also realized, which was as tra tragic, that when Jewish students were mentioned, their identity existed as people who might have view on the Israel-Palestine situation. So this is a, a strange kind of um, shorthand, which leads to negative stereotyping. We would recommend recommend that active support for the power to speak could function as a really powerful antidote to this democratic deficit that we identified. But it would require training, it would require practice. The skills are all there. We had many conversations with highly skilled members of staff who could have easily um, enacted their competence in this area but it tends to not happen currently. The second term I introduced is epistemic injustice. It seemed very clear to us over time that, the, that there was a lot of discrimination on campus. Sometimes it was petty, sometimes it was thoughtless, sometimes it was deliberate and sometimes Sometimes it was related to people's clothing, sometimes it was related to their gender, their perceived nationality. This epistemic injustice had the effect of diminishing the understanding about whether that individual had anything worth saying. So in terms of the first point I make about the democratic deficit being reduced by freedom of speech, being empowered, this could also be effective with epistemic justice, but even more than that, we encountered many staff and students who invited us to consider how powerful it would be on campuses to improve the already existing communal opportunities. The possibility to be sociable in an atmosphere that is well lit, the possibility to be sociable in an atmosphere where there is no alcohol. The idea that there are options beyond the excellent work done by chaplains, for example, and interfaith centers. There are options available on campus to have conversations about difficult topics in a relaxed atmosphere. But this again needs to be specifically choreographed. The third term I mentioned is the hermeneutics of suspicion. This belief that by interpreting people's actions, we may know more about them than they know about themselves. So hermeneutics, as you probably know from literature, is the, the ability to dig deeper into a text, to understand below the surface features of written text. And it's now been extrapolated to understanding 
the way we act to looking at our understanding of each other's actions. If we were to acknowledge openly and publicly that discrimination against Muslims, but also against anybody who is considered to be different from the majority, if we accept that, then we are halfway to resolving the hermeneutics of suspicion and turning it into, into perhaps a pedagogy of hope. There is plenty of evidence from our research that if we were to expand Islamic studies, as Sharuk suggested, we could draw upon the expertise of the Islamic colleges with whom we worked, of our sample of six universities for our ethnographic research, we worked with two Islamic colleges. They have immense knowledge and learning and obviously competence in Arabic, which would open many doors on the mainstream so-called secular campuses for these difficult conversations. And I think it's reasonable to say that we were, at the end of our study, heartened and excited by the potential that exists on the campuses we visited to transform some of our very negative findings into really, really powerful and potent. Thank you, Alison. Um, I was struck there by your um, idea of a pedagogy of, of hope, which perhaps we can investigate a bit further uh, in the, the question and answer session. Um, that was one of the things that struck me about the book was that it was very, uh, as you've heard, it was very uh, forensic in its analysis of some of the shortcomings and the double standards too, which we may, may want to talk about. But at the same time, it was able to offer um, ways forward and, and, and adjustments to practice, uh, things that could be done quite easily in many ways, as we've heard, which, which could make a difference. Um, so thank you very much to our, our three presenters on, on that book. Um, we'll move straight on to Professor Tarek Madhu. Um, just the only thing I'll say before that, and please do feel free to um, put some questions in the, the Q&A and I will uh, attempt to sort of distill and convey them as time goes on. Um, a little bit about um, Tarek's book first, and then I'll, I'll introduce someone who really needs no introduction at all. Um, <clears throat> this book, as I said, is called Essays on Secularism and Multiculturalism. Uh, and it, in, in a way, it begins, I think, from this question of whether Muslims can be accommodated um, in uh, as religious groups within European countries. And of course, it's the one of the central questions of our time reiterated over and over again in political discourse, in reaction to incidents and things that we've seen, unfortunately, very recently. But in this particular collection of essays, Tarek Modoud argues that to grasp the nature of this challenge, we have to see how Muslims have become targets of cultural racism, uh, uh, Islamophobia, that's his, his understanding of that, um, along with, I think, the, the recent definition uh, of the All Parliamentary Working Group, which also identified Islamophobia as a form of uh, cultural racism. But the problem is not just one of anti-racism, it's one of multicultural citizenship, and who better to guide us through that particular labyrinth than, than Professor Tarek Modoud. Uh, as I say, he really needs no introduction, but he is Professor of Sociology, Politics and Public Policy, uh, and the founding director of the Centre for the study of ethnicity and citizenship in the University of Bristol. He was awarded an MBE for services to social science and ethnic relations in 2001 and elected a fellow of the British Academy in 2017. He served on the Commission on Multi-Ethnic Britain, the National Equality Panel and the Commission on Religion and Belief in British Public Life. His books, there are so many of them and have been so important to, to all of us working in this particular field uh, include the, the two editions of his book on multiculturalism, which is a, a classic in its own right. He was co-editor of Multiculturalism and Interculturalism, which is a book I found particularly useful, uh, and The Problem of Religious Diversity uh, in 2017. And so the latest book, the one we're going to hear about tonight, um, is a really a distillation of some of that work, I think it's fair to say. So um, Tarek, if you could tell us more, it would be much appreciated. 
Um, thank you very much, Peter. That was a very generous introduction. And thank you, Amina Yakin, for the invitation to participate uh, in, in this uh, event. So, as Peter says, this is a, uh, a collection of essays, in fact, um, across 2005 to 2018. Um, and I suppose the first distinctive thing I might say about it is that it's an interdisciplinary uh, work. Perhaps that's not so distinctive these days because we all, I think, tend to uh, work in interdisciplinary ways. But the disciplines that I mainly work in are sociology and political theory and try to bring them together. And I think that's only a minority of, of people, people do that. Again, as Peter said, the book begins with what I call way back going back to the mid 1990s and so on, cultural racism and Islamophobia, where it's directed at Muslims. And um, at the time, that was a, a fairly novel idea. But now I'm pleased to say that it ha has become the standard interpretation of Islamophobia, a contrast one can see very clearly if one looks at the, the pioneering first study report on Islamophobia by the Runnymede Trust, which was in 1997, which saw it much more in terms of uh, prejudice and hostility to the study, their report in 2017, which expressly saw it in cultural racism. And as Peter mentioned, so does the all party parliamentary groups definition of, of Islamophobia. And the book offers an account of some Muslim controversies and of Muslims as political actors, specifically as what I might call race relations or multiculturalist actors. Again, I think that is now widely accepted and is relatively a familiar story as far as Britain is concerned anyway. And then more than half the book engages with the idea of political secularism or secularisms. So why do I end up there, you know, with political secularism? Why do I uh, take um, the argument in that direction when probably the, the dominant uh, ways in which uh, Islamophobia is being studied these days are security and radicalization or um, issues around gender and cultural identities, ethno-religious identities. In fact, some of the themes that um, the, the other book, Islam on Campus, uh, has, has studied. And what have I got to say about political secularism? Well, I think the trajectory to explain why I got to political secularism goes something like this. So I understand multiculturalism to be focused on minority identities within a certain kind of range, race, ethnicity, minority, religious, or of course, a mixture of, 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 these, of these things. And the important point about them is that these are not personal identities or private identities, they're identities whether they be negative or positive, whether they be imposed from the outside or asserted by individuals, you know, acting in groups uh, themselves, they are public identities. And one of the ways in which uh, this, these public identities um, has been theorized about, and that's certainly uh, been the approach I've taken, is um, following Charles Taylor's idea of recognition, how misrecognition is a, a form of harm. And to overturn that, to redress that, we seek uh, positive identities. And these are identities as the bearers of the identities understand their sense of who they are, not how they are stereotyped or othered by other people, by the dominant group. Again, some of the themes uh, that we've already heard about uh, this evening and in many ways we're familiar with. 
But the problem arises if these public identities that we seek multiculturalist recognition for are religious identities. Because for quite a lot of people in societies like Britain in Western Europe and uh, other places like that, religion has come to be thought of as suitable as a private identity and not as a public issue. So, you know, people wear badges to do with their politics, um, gender identities, sexualities, and so on. But if you're wearing um, religious badges and insignia and so on, that's regarded as a bit intrusive. You know, I don't, I don't want your religion in my face. So that's really how I got interested, you know, going back a couple of decades in political secularism, because political secularism is a set of ideas and institutional arrangements about what the relationship should be between the state and organized religion, but more generally between what we might call the public sphere, public identities, civic identities, and uh, religious communities, religious identities, and so on, and on what terms they can be accommodated by the state or other institution, institutions like universities, like uh, secular universities. So that's how I, I make this linkage, have come to make this linkage over many years between the pursuit of a project of multicultural equality and the interrogation of contemporary forms of political secularism, which can either enhance that multiculturalist project, or at least are compatible with it, or they can block it by insisting, as they do, for instance, in certain interpretations of French laïcité, that religious identities should really be private, should be kept out of the public space. And so therefore, um, that really creates a impossibility for pursuing a multiculturalist project. In terms of what I've got to say about political secularism, I'm going to have to be very brief, but happy to obviously discuss it, discuss it further. Um, some of the steps in the argument are really, the first one being that the, what we might call the knee jerk understanding of secularism as a kind of separation of uh, church and state or religion and politics and so on is actually a complete misdescription of virtually all the countries in the world, including countries that we call democracies, even liberal democracies, with some partial exceptions, like the United States in one kind of way and uh, France in another kind of way, but they're only partial exceptions as well. Though I don't want to uh, spend my time uh, just talking about uh, those countries and those details. But if we look at our own country, and um, in fact, the whole of Northwestern Europe, stretching from here to Belgium, the Netherlands, Nordic countries, uh, Germany, Austria, and so on, what we actually have is what I've characterized as moderate secularism, because there are quite clearly church state linkages that carry on, even if in a residual form to compare to what they might have been 50 years ago or 250 years ago and so on, but, but they continue and they can have a very big fiscal resource um, implications, like for instance, the funding of um, faith schools um, or religious instruction in state schools. Um, and some people then say, well, that just shows you that these countries aren't really secularist, you know, including our own with the Church of England as an established church and the Queen, um, both as the head of state and the supreme governor of, of the Church of England. But my reaction to that is, 
But these countries, you know, in particular, Northwestern Europe, these countries are exactly where our understanding of political secularism was born. If these countries aren't secularist, then really secularism doesn't, doesn't exist or is a very marginal phenomenon, uh, even in um, democracies and even in uh, Western countries. So I take the opposite approach, which is to say, well, actually, these countries are what we mean when we talk about secular democracies and secular states. These are the countries that we are talking about. And therefore, what exists in these countries is what we should call political secularism. And what we need to do is to properly theorize, to conceptualize the actual arrangements that exist of political secularism, rather than have an abstract idea about separatism from which we conclude that secularism hardly, hardly exists uh, in the world. And so I characterize um, the countries that I've mentioned in this region as forms of moderate secularism. And I construct a Vivarian ideal type to describe what this moderate secularism is. And in a way, this, this reflects, it's an important point here, it reflects my, my method, namely that concepts, analytical and theoretical concepts are built from actual contexts and practices, not defined abstractly or a priori, and then we create independent uh, arguments um, and independently try and identify uh, whether our abstract concepts have actual uh, cases. Um, this Viberian type I mentioned of moderate secularism has five characteristics, which I don't really have time to uh, say very much about at all, but maybe I'll just mention one because it's perhaps the most controversial feature. When I say the most controversial feature, I mean the most controversial feature in my conceptualization, not necessarily controversial uh, in contemporary politics, though perhaps, perhaps it can be. And that is that I argue that an important feature of countries like Britain and the Netherlands and um, Sweden and Germany and so on, is that religion, organized religion, is seen as a potential source of public good and of course public harm, but that's perhaps taken for granted. We perhaps all take it for granted that states have to regulate religion where they think they're doing some harm, like for instance, causing social divisions or violence or uh, something like that. But the important point is that public good is also part of the understanding uh, in moderate secularism of what religion is capable of. And that is why the state gets involved. That is why we don't have separatism, uh, but we have connection, involvement, because the state wants to enable the public good, whatever that might be, welfare, charity, education, stable family, the building up of social capital, whatever these various goods might be, including of course, national identity, because actually, uh, the churches have played a large role uh, in the identities of these countries, including, of course, our, our own and, and, and so on. And so if we're talking about the public good for organized religion within moderate secularism, then actually we can make a good connection with multiculturalism, because I said to you that multiculturalism was about uh, public identities, positive public identities, defeating negative uh, racialized stereotypes and, and othering. And unlike Weber, my uh, um, ideal types are normative. He expressly said that social sciences couldn't be normative, shouldn't try to be and so on. I totally disagree with that and I do the opposite. I uh, suggest that moderate sectorism has some reasonable purposes and that there are some justifications and of course adaptations so is not an uncritical acceptance of whatever exists but that basically there are arguments for and against 
how we might do things already within the uh, structures and institutions of moderate secularism. Um, that then leads to the question about uh, multiculturalizing uh, moderate secular states, but I can see that I'm being quite tight on time here, so I maybe just select one or two final points to uh, conclude on. Um, so even though several chapters of the book are engagements with what I might call liberal political theory of secularism, showing, showing its uh, limitations, either in, because it misdescribes the world or because it forecloses the possibilities of multicultural uh, recognition. I should emphasize one or two aspects of what I understand by multiculturalism by way of closing. I don't understand it as, to borrow again from Charles Taylor, I don't understand it as subtractive, but as additive, or what I call equalizing upwards. So the issue about how to include groups like Muslims, who of course are my central uh, case in my uh, book and in my theorizing in general, how to include groups like Muslims without dispossessing other groups, for instance, uh, Christians or other groups. So it's, um, that's what we mean by additive, not subtraction. So it's a multiculturalism that is sympathetic to historical uh, and ma ma majority identities and institutions, but it's not majoritarianism. That is to say, it always wants to identify what are the minorities' distinctive needs that must be accommodated, must be accommodated in the light of egalitarian arguments, especially th those to do with respect and inclusion. And minority needs shouldn't be judged by majority requirements. So it's not good enough to say, as they often say in municipalities across France, that why should schools provide kosher or halal meals, they don't provide any special diet for Christians. Well, that is a total misunderstanding of, of equality. Jewish and Muslim requirements should not be judged by the requirements of some other religious group. And so that's how I build up a concept of multicultural equality, which is additive, not subtractive, which is not about um, dispossessing majority provisions and majority identities, but a, a matter of not using the majority provisions as a way of excluding minority needs and minority accommodation. And finally, I also want to emphasize commonalities and common identities should also be cultivated, and not least a national identity. So it's a multiculturalism, because it centers on equal citizenship and national citizenship is the strongest form of citizenship that we know. So the more we load onto citizenship, and I do load quite a lot onto my concept of citizenship, the more we load onto it, in a way we become closer to national citizenship rather than distant from it. But I do argue that national citizenship has to be remade and that means also rethinking our sense of country, remaking our national identity. Because citizenship is itself an identity. So it's not just about multiculturalism, it isn't just about minority identities. It's also about citizenship as an identity, not just a bundle of rights and duties. And the highest level of citizenship, I believe, is where it's able to confer a sense of belonging to all its citizens, that they belong together and they belong together to their political community. Thank you. Maybe I'll just share a, a screen of the, the book's cover so you can see it. And as you can see, there is a discount code if you want to make a note of it. Um, otherwise, you can also find it on my website. Thank you very much.
someone someone else perhaps has to stop the sharing i don't know whether i can last time someone else stopped it is that good Ah, oh, good. Yeah. So I think that stopped it. Thank you, whoever did that. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Tarek. Um, we fill time. We fill time that's normally taken up with enthusiastic, thunderous applause after all our speakers. And so we're, I can imagine I can kind of hear virtually the, the applause from behind all the, the computer screens. Um, Thank you for four really very stimulating and all, all differently angled takes, but there are certain things they have in common and I can see we have some questions, so I'll, I won't delay in moving on to those. Only really to say that um, I think it's very interesting that one of the things that appears to be held in common in your two projects in a way is this, this thing that Tarek called equalizing upwards in a way. In other words, it's not kind of stripping away other people's rights or or putting somebody in over somebody else and therefore reducing the other group's bit, as it were, uh, that this is actually about kind of making inclusive structures like the university, for example, which have desire to be inclusive a lot of the time, but don't necessarily allow that uh, to, to, to take place in practice. And I think that's one of the, the findings that strikes you most from uh, Alison uh, and her team and their book. Um, and the other thing, actually, which is interesting as well, is that I think you both share an idea of religion, which, again, Tarek put into words very well at the end, as a potential source for public good, which is, of course, at odds with the very kind of hardline secularist view of where religion belongs or indeed doesn't belong. And so I'm sure these are things that we may well come back to as well. But I shall not hog the stage because there's some very interesting questions coming in. Um, there are a couple, perhaps I can just bring these two together because they seem to be similarly angled for Alison and the team. And they're kind of methodology questions. So that, this is very interesting and important in your work. Um, the first one says, Alison, you talked about some suspicion towards the project, particularly in regards to prevent. Can you tell us a bit more about the institutional reception and perception of your work? How we all perceive, treated and dealt with once you had access to campus. The other one I want to roll into that rather cheekily, but it does seem to be similar, uh, is the second question about your interviewing and the participants. How forthcoming were they in answering your questions? And did the, the setting or the interview or the method matter much? Did you feel like they were holding back? There were lots of questions all kind of in together in those two, but they're essentially methodology ones. So Alison, sure, yeah. uh, Matthew, you can, you can um, turn your cameras on again if, if you'd like to and uh, maybe answer answer some of those uh, questions. Shall I, shall I start? So Yaffa and Eva, thank you very much for both your questions. I will answer them kind of together, although I do see that they're distinct. Yes, people were very suspicious of our activities on campus to start with because the prevent uh, duty was in force. Now, that was in 2016-17. We know that actually from official records in 2017, across the whole of the higher education sector, 15 people were referred to Channel, which is the, um, the sort of curing arm, the arm that will rehabilitate you if you have bad thoughts. Uh, the, that Channel is related to prevent. Now 15, one five is a very small number. However, the level of discontent and concern on campus about students and staff who knew about prevent and as I said before this was a minority but they were very worried about what we might actually be up to so in order to counteract that and this comes on now from Yaffa's question to Eva's question in order to counteract that we set up a really complex uh, system whereby their identity was protected even more rigorously than normal to the best of our absolute ability. So we, we kept separate records of their names and their, the number that was allocated to them. We also, and this sounds ridiculous, but it worked brilliantly. During focus groups, we allocated each person a number and we asked them to address, to refer to themselves. So I would say, number th I'm number three, I have a point, please. I want to speak. 
And we thought this might, when we first tried it, uh, we felt that it was a good idea, theoretically, because it would allow people to avoid using each other's names because sometimes they knew each other. It would allow us to clean the transcripts later, more successfully. Uh, but we thought it, it might be a terrible failure because they would just find it ridiculous. Actually, they found it delightful and very liberating. And they even went to the extent sometimes of saying, so, so I'm number three, I have something to say, and I want to say that I agree with number seven. So they completely, staff and students, entered into this fully. And so this is uh, Afa's question, really. I don't, I, didn't, I don't think we felt that they were holding back massively. I think we felt that they were as honest as they felt they could be. Um, clearly, there were issues that they might not want to embark on if they felt that they were on the edge of legality, but none of them felt they were at risk on campus, and most of them felt that they could speak pretty openly to us, and if they were in a focus group, to other people. So that was a great success, but Matthew might want to add aspects of the quantitative material. I don't know if you want to say something about that as well, Matthew. Um, not, not, not really. I mean, the, the similar issues didn't really come up as much because of the nature of the method and the, the, the use of an anonymized online uh, survey instrument. Um, but um, what you've described, Alison, resonates with my own experience of the field work. I mean, there's, there's, I think it varied significantly as well, though, across campuses. I mean, there's the, it, it's interesting to, to identify which university campuses are especially um, sensitive to prevent related issues and which are relatively oblivious um, because there are huge variations and but also um, patterns which are quite worrying like uh, I remember uh, one particular um, exchange with a, a student who was who had internalized the need to be suspicious of other people on campus even though she was at a university which had no record of having any problems whatsoever, was distant from any examples that had been in the media. She'd never heard of anything happening, but had still internalized that sense of, we ought to be a little bit careful about things uh, and changed her behavior accordingly. So that, that, that there was a kind of infectiousness about the anxiety that that kind of policy had fostered, I think. Thank you, yeah, that, that's very interesting. I think that uh, Shuruk, did you have any uh, uh, thoughts on that? Uh, yes, I, I just wanted to add a point about positionality, um, that with the qualitative data on campuses, uh, we actually um, had uh, one member of the team who was always uh, attending and uh, the, the other member of the team, uh, which was either Matthew, Alison, myself or Saria changed. Uh, but because the position, positionality shifted on the different campuses, the how we were received also shifted and shifted also in terms of how the participants opened up to answer Ava's question or to link both questions together. Uh, so uh, on some campuses, uh, Muslim women would open up to me or Muslim staff would open up to me as well as students uh, or feel a certain affinity, whereas on, uh, on other occasions, my Muslim uh, positionality would, uh, would either inhibit the discussion in some ways because people would be wary or would open it up in a different direction. So one example, I remember one of my last interviews was with uh, a right-wing white Muslim student. Uh, who uh, was very uh, reserved at the beginning of the interview, but as we started to talk, uh, he, he opened up a, a bit more. And in the middle of the interview, he said, can I ask you a question? Because you're actually the first Muslim woman that uh, I feel I can ask her questions about these things. Uh, and he started to, to, to actually interrogate me uh, as many students, many Muslim students and, and sometimes Muslim staff are interrogated uh, in, in the public domain, but also in the workplaces and in the classroom about their identity and their faith commitment. Um, it, it, was an, it was an interesting experience because in his interrogation, I learned a lot more about his assumptions than 
through the actual interview and the actual answers. So the ethnographic observations that went along with the qualitative interview method was also very useful, was very helpful. And uh, the gatekeepers were all people we've known for such a long time. So the initial reception was always uh, great and uh, we were grounded in uh, a network of support within each campus through our gatekeepers. So thank you to them, whatever they are. Thank you, that's great. I mean, it, it answers very well that, that second question, uh, Eva's question about the interview and method and how that, that works. Um, just, just before we, we move on, there's another one that's, that's popped up now, um, which follows on, I think, slightly from that, uh, which is about maybe subject students felt they couldn't openly discuss. Did you come across much of that? Sure. I mean, the, the interesting thing, Rabina, was that we what we haven't mentioned yet is that one of our methodological processes was to work through the student union whenever possible. Now, this was sometimes difficult because the student union might be suspicious of us, but that meant that we were gaining their trust and they would then use their own dissemination methodology to uh, attract people to become part of the work. But what happened coincidentally as a result of that approach, Rubina, was that sometimes we would meet somebody in a corridor or in the student union offices who would say, and I, I did refer to this earlier in passing, they'd say, this works really interesting we, we need to speak about the counter-terror agenda. We, we, we as young, particularly young male Muslims, we are very uncomfortable at being perceived as dangerous, but it's absolutely impossible for us to take part in your study because even though you are assuring us of maximal confidentiality, we don't think it's worth the risk. So they, you know, we had some fascinating conversations which we couldn't record. Uh, we didn't, we wouldn't dream of attributing them to particular individuals or particular campuses. Um, but they were, it was often young Muslim males who felt that they were being, that everything they did was perceived as potentially dangerous. And, you know, that remember this may be milder now. People may have got used to it. We also found that a lot of young Muslims had accustomed themselves to this pressure and just dealt with it in a very gracious, generous way. But that's that's horrendous that they have to make that effort. But Rabina, the other thing I will just mention briefly, if I may, Peter, that when Israel-Palestine was mentioned, um, it, it was often uh, done in a um, quite a cautious way because the students and the staff involved realized that this was a very contentious issue. They didn't want to be misunderstood. So they would refer to the fact that, you know, we, 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 we fixed up a meeting to discuss this. It was very difficult to arrange the meeting, but we, we managed and we had some kind of useful discussion. But there's obviously, there are obviously issues like that where they feel that, there, that it is unsatisfactory. It, it comes back to my point about the democratic deficit that they wish to inform themselves. So many staff and students, just, just rounding off now, sorry to go on, but so many staff and students said to us, we need to talk more about these difficult topics, not less. If we're being encouraged, if we're being discouraged from discussing them, this is really bad for democracy. And we are the future generations who will be running things when you guys are no longer here. We, we mustn't be stopped. We must be encouraged and, and helped and supported to have these difficult discussions. Thank you, um, Alison. I mean, that, that relates to the, the point I was feeling my way towards earlier about um, some double standards that, that I think you've uncovered, that, that Tarek's work uh, over many years has uncovered. And perhaps we could talk about those in, in a moment. There is a question for, for Tarek now, which has been waiting for a while. And it takes us slightly away from our Western European focus. And it's just about uh, marginalization within Islamic societies. The example given by Sirwan is uh, about um, a state with Shia rulers who might marginalize Sunnis or vice versa. And whether it could be theorized, whether there's a solution to that issue within secularism or multiculturalism as, as you imagine it, or does it come out of a particular soil uh, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily travel, Tariq? 
Yeah, thank you. I saw that question. Um, I think there is an element of uh, where you ended, Peter, that namely that in order for some of the things I'm talking about to be useful to people uh, in, say, the Middle East or somewhere else, in Asia somewhere, um, there have to be certain institutions and norms, um, certain kinds of you know, political arrangements in place, because I'm kind of building on those because my work is, as I've said, quite contextualist even though it's quite normative, I'm trying to develop the, a certain normative perspective out of a context. So I, I'd be reluctant to say, well, yes. But on the other hand, I think to just say no would be wrong as well, because there, there can always be some points of contact and extrapolation and adaptation to a different context so that you may end up with something that was different to what you started off with, but it didn't mean it doesn't mean that you haven't used some of, say, ideas about multicultural citizenship and so on. And one thing to mention here is that I'm currently working on a very large project with um, many uh, many partners. I think we're thirteen altogether, looking at twenty three countries in five world regions, and that certainly includes uh, MENA and it includes Southeast Asia and um, various other regions. And when we were first, I, I'm doing this uh, together with uh, Anna Trian de Filidou, who used to be at the European University Institute and is now at Ryerson University in Toronto. So when we first thinking about this project, you know, way, way back before we even started writing a proposal or anything like that, uh, we thought, and I think Anna more than me, thought that, ah, somehow European problems could be um, dealt with by learning from what was happening in the Middle East or India or Indonesia, Malaysia, somewhere like that. I wasn't quite as enthusiastic as she was because I felt I knew a little bit more about those countries and I knew that they had their own problems. But a distinction that we kind of have worked with then, right at the beginning and, 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 and now, but it's become even sharper, is that the, I mean, Europe has um, had a lot of cultural and in particular religious homogeneity, if by the religion here, we mean Christianity. Obviously, there's loads of diversity within Christianity, as we all know, but it's not like having Christianity and Buddhism and Hinduism and Islam all together, as for instance, you know, in some parts of the Middle East or certainly in India, for instance, or uh, Indonesia. So, but on the other hand, um, Europe has developed certain uh, ideas about um, liberal freedoms, which actually originate with the idea of religious freedom and freedom of conscience, and even developing them into human rights and so on. It still has the root that the state shouldn't be able to tell an individual what to believe, you know, what is the true religion as it were. And yet we have this, as I say, this context of relative homogeneity. And then if we look at Middle East or India, you have a lot more socio-cultural and religious diversity, you know, historical diversity over long, long periods of time, centuries. And yet without the same legal rights and safeguards and um, respect for freedom of conscience dissent is often marginalized and, and curbed, if not by the state, then by organized religious groups themselves, like organized Sunni Islam or organized Shia Islam. And so we thought, ah, could we learn something? You know, this is, if you like, a multiculturalist quest. Could we learn something from the socio-cultural 
diversity dynamics mm. of countries that have known diversity and taken it for granted for centuries and see if we could marry it to the more democratic structures of like Western Europe. But what we've actually found when we were writing our proposal and then getting it funded and now the project's about halfway in is that the countries that we'd hoped to get this, these diversity rich, diversity sensitive insights from have been moving quite rapidly towards a more authoritarian majoritarianism than we even know in Europe. So India is such a perfect example. I mean, we talk about Islamophobia in Europe, but we don't have mass pogroms of Muslims in the way that um, India is now under the BJP, now beginning to experience. There's real persecution of Muslims uh, in India, even though you could say, historically, Muslims and Hindus found ways of living together across many generations and not just learning to live together, but sometimes also in very respectful ways of um, joining in other people's holy days, religious celebrations, um, you know, pilgrimages to shrines and so on. Not because they wanted to say, well, I believe the same as you do, but to show that I join you in your religious sympathies. You know, that there is a meeting point in our religious understandings, even though we have different holy books and different, uh, you know, clergy or authoritative structures and whatever. So it's rather worrying because a lot of people who don't look across the globe but are transfixed on Europe and North America think that all the populist nationalism is here and they're associated with white supremacism and so on. Actually, there's a lot of populist nationalism across many parts of the world. And the one that Muslims are suffering most under at the moment is in India and of course, Xinjiang province and other parts of China. So our kind of quest to marry the, the social richness of the Middle East and Asia with the democratic norms and law structures of Western Europe isn't quite working out as we'd hoped. Thank you very much. That was a very rich answer. I, I might, well, I will invite um, other panelists to address it as well. But you raised the, the dreaded P word in terms of populism there. Uh, and, and, I, and I wonder if you feel uh, not discouraged exactly, but but popular is, populism. You know the way it operates in terms of saying, well, well, you this group here, you're are you're the real people, and this other group isn't the people, and that seems to be one common denominator in a very diverse set of authoritarian moves, as it were. Um, but that's kind of pulling in a in a completely opposite direction to what you described as moderate secularism, isn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, there are lots of developments in the world, uh, well, let's just say Britain, um, that I can't be uh, optimistic about or that I think, oh yeah, this is how I'd like things to go. Um, um, I certainly agree with that. And a lot of them are attitudinally and politically tied up with Brexit, by which I don't mean whether we are for, um, you know, being in the European Union or outside. What I mean is there's a whole cluster of um, political and cultural attitudes, often to do with identity and a sense of being marginalized by dominant narratives. By dominant narratives, I mean the kinds of narratives that we pick up from uh, the BBC or the media or the children are being introduced to at schools and so on. So uh, in many ways, uh, the Brexit constituency, which then of course also, you know, voted in our present government, has managed to combine those who feel excluded and marginalized by the way the British public life and British identity is being developing, i.e. in a multi-ethnic direction, and they don't 
feel that they, they're being sufficiently included in a respectful way or in a way that they believe is their entitlement. It's married that group of people with an elite who, well, in many ways is a perhaps a traditional elite, certainly a kind of neoliberal elite. Um, and this is part, part of our predicament. And multiculturalism is therefore caught in this pincer movement by a kind of resentful kind of folk feeling that people like us are being ignored in favor of all those minorities in Birmingham and London. And on the other hand, a more transnational elite that are very mobile, both in terms of their own personal movements, but in very mobile in terms of, you know, their money and their interests and their careers and everything like that. So, yeah, lots of things are happening that aren't good for multiculturalism, but I don't think, uh, I mean, I'm probably already taking too long, but I'll just say, and maybe leave it to later for elaboration. I don't think that it'd be true to say, as some people say, we used to be moving in a multiculturalist direction, now we're moving in reverse. I don't think that's true. I think we've always had uh, countervailing movements and some of the forward movement for multiculturalism is actually continuing even while there are all these, well, there are some of these negative trends that I've just referred to. Thank you. That, yeah, that's fascinating. Um, I mean, I, do, do, do any of our other authors want to come in on that? There's further to, to take that particular question. Was there anything you observed? Because obviously you were conducting this research in a way at this, this Brexit moment or thereabouts that Tariq has, has mentioned. Did you feel that came to bear in any of the responses that you had or the, the ways you could conduct yourself? Well, it was certainly fascinating the ways in which right-wing populism um, as we understand it in Britain, is definitely contaminating the campus. I mean, there are not many right-wing populist students or staff. There are some. The majority are either the majority of staff or students are either leftish or liberalish or agnostic. But we did find very clear evidence that this this interference from right-wing populism is confusing people. So, you know the. The right wing populist accuses the student of being a snowflake who melts at the, the slightest whiff of controversy, or of being a proto terrorist who's, going, who's encouraging extremists onto campus in order to radicalize others. Obviously, the student body can't be both snowflakes and terrorists because you're, you're melting or burning simultaneously. It just it doesn't work. But this doesn't matter. The ex the, these two extremes are the way in which the right-wing populist discourse functions. So you've got, for example, spiked online with a libertarian approach, quite self-avowed libertarian, it's quite open. They would argue that students are snowflakes and they should just wise up and smarten up and encourage free speech of, of all sorts. It's not, not really what they mean. What they mean is encourage free speech of, of the areas that spiked likes. But this is quite an extreme position and there's plenty of accusation in the public discourse of a country like this which asserts this and then on the other side you've got the henry jackson society who argue that students are not snowflakes at all they're proto-terrorists they should be stopped from encouraging islamic speakers to come and address the students on campus and no platforming should be used so again this free speech argument is deliberately polarizing itself I mean, Spiked and Henry Jackson are not averse to each other's ideas. They just adopt a particular extreme position and it, it definitely confuses the possibility of open and balanced discourse on campus. And I think that's another reason why a lot of people have given up trying to have difficult conversations. It's something that Matthew actually raised, I think in his chapter, was it chapter one or chapter two early on in the book? Um, and I think you referred, Matthew, to the segregated seating controversy at UCL yeah. back in 2013, which I remember because we had an event scheduled for the following week and I got a very concerned phone call from somebody high up in the university at East London at that point going, they're not going to be segregated, are they? And uh, it was uh, the speaker was Honora O'Neill who was talking about trust. And I said, no, I think you can guarantee they won't be segregated. 
in that one. But but you were talking about that one, and I wondered because you also bring the story up to very much the present moment, really. I mean, to to the COVID moment, if if you like. Um, about this trend that you identify there for direct government intervention in HE that's grown in recent years. Mm. Um, I mean, we see it very much now in a sense because, you know, with, with COVID and concerns about university finance, <laughs> there's always a sort of idea that, uh, you know, well, well, we'll bail you out, but we'll bail you out on condition you do this or that. And of course, one of the latest ones is the, um, the um, Williamson um, stipulation about uh, free speech on campus. So I wondered if, if what, what feeling you got from your interviewees about that is we're back to this thing about double standards, aren't we? That in a sense, um, you know, certain kinds of uh, debating positions are not being allowed or not being encouraged or being discouraged. Certain topics are off limits. And yet at the same time, the government's pushing this idea that uh, what they want to do is secure free speech on campus. I, th I think it's... it's... <laughs> It's a fascinating political move on the part of the government, which presents universities as part of a, um, it, it, in a way, it, it presents them as a foil for the populist argument. Um, it, it's it's the, uh, the accusation that universities conspire with a liberal uh, agenda to um, elevate the interests of minority groups at the expense of the, uh, of the white majority. Um, which, given the marketized nature of the, of the sector, um, which of course has emerged at the same time as has been an acceleration of state intervention and regulation, makes many universities, you know, Oxford and Cambridge probably exception, accepted, uh, makes them very nervous about, about doing things that might um, be perceived as dissenting from a government line. So I think that there's, there's, there's a cynical strategy that drives this that encourages universities and institutions to be more risk averse than they already are. Um, I don't think there's a, a major problem with freedom of speech in universities. I think um, there is, it's a cynical use of that accusation on the part of political actors to uh, push things in a particular direction. Um, there are of course cases of no platforming and, and um, uh, an exaggeration of the whole safe space agenda that um, pushes against uh, that. Um, but in most cases, from, from what I can gather, that, that that's, uh, it, it's, it's not a, 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 an endemic problem in the sector. Um, but one thing that we, we have to do is find ways of disagreeing respectfully. I mean, I think that's one thing that the university sector has become very bad at is, is uh, um, finding a way of fostering a context in which um, disagreement could be public, but also respectful, uh, and debate can be constructive, but also full and frank. I mean, um, the when you have some reactions to that being um, a closing down of debate, and on other reactions being um, uh, the elevation of certain agendas to dismiss others, then you have the worst of both worlds. So I think there's work that we can do, but universities can only do that if they feel empowered to do so without being uh, unfairly um, uh, sanctioned um, by government uh, agencies. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I think it's very interesting because for the most part, this is now kind of <laughs> personal gripe, of course, but you know, the, the universities have been whipping, whipping boys, girls, persons, um, you know, for a while, and now today, I think they're they're in their good books again because they're doing something they like about with with COVID and keeping the keeping students locked up and whatever. So I I don't quite understand how that all works. But your your analysis of it was was very good, I thought, and, and absolutely right. Um, there's, there was another question actually for Tarek about Canada embracing multiculturalism, whereas Europe and the UK feels threatened with the concept and the question that goes on to talk about the quality of political leadership and, and divisiveness and I suppose that takes us back to the, the populism um, question again uh, and, and without wanting to steal or, or kind of gloss in an unwelcome way the question I wonder whether one of the things that, that might be worth thinking about there is, is the fact that actually you, you outline in, and thank you by the way for, for sending uh, your your introduction this this afternoon. I had a look and and it struck me very forcibly that you do make a distinction there between the uh, moderate secularism in in large parts of Europe 
and the, the French model, um, which I think you described as religion marginalizing radical secularism. So uh, that is kind of to rather steal and, and manipulate the original question, but those international variations do do matter, don't they? And the French are the French outliers in that respect. Sorry, are the French what? Are they are they sort of outliers in that respect to the rest well, of Europe? Actually, I thought you were raising the uh, point about France because, in a sense, Canada includes a little bit of France. That's right. You got me. Yeah. So um, thank you for that question. Uh, I'm a great admirer of uh, multiculturalism in Canada. I think everybody agrees that in terms of uh, state enactments and political leadership and formal policies, Canada is the pioneer, you know, in the modern period, is the pioneer of multiculturalism. And certainly I hold that view and I think, you know, the fact that so many Canadians, I think it's about 80% or more, uh, think of multiculturalism as part of the Canadian national identity um, is of course, you know, a great success for multiculturalism. And uh, I wish we had a bit more of that here. But having said that, I think um, there are certain qualifying um, points one should be aware of so that one doesn't see everything uh, in too, you know, too dark and too fair a comparison, that there are a kind of qualifying um, issues. So the first one is, if we're talking about post-migration multiculturalism, and that is all I, I work on, but of course in Canada, some theorists like Will Kimlicker, for instance, when they talk about multiculturalism, are often talking about the relationship between the Canadian federal state and indigenous peoples, and the Canadian federal state and the province of Quebec. So those are different issues. But if we're just talking about post-immigration multiculturalism, I mean, the first thing to note is how selective Canada has been, not just recently, but always about who it lets in. So I remember once, uh, my, my sister, by the way, uh, migrated to Canada in the 1970s because she married a Canadian. And I thought, well, yes, I'd like to, to join her. And um, I was a postgraduate student, hoping to finish my PhD and then look for a job. But when I wrote to the Canadian uh, consulate, because you were invited to see whether you were a suitable person, they sent me a list of occupations that you had to have qualifications in, in order to then be even given an application form to fill in. And university lectureship, which is what I wanted to do, was not on that list. So Canada has been very selective on the basis of skills and occupations. Now, this is spread across the world and we ourselves uh, employ those criteria as well. And Australia is another country that led the way in doing that. But what is interesting is that some of the countries that stand out uh, in terms of political multiculturalism have been very selective in basically, if you like, choosing middle-class people or people who have the potential to become middle-class professional people. If we look at migration into Western Europe, this country included, it hasn't been like that. You know, if we look at it over, say, 75 years, the post-colonial migration from, you know, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, the Caribbean, and, and the French colonies and the Portuguese colonies and the Dutch colonies and so on, was not like that. People came from rural Punjab and rural Silla and um, places like that, and they came from the West Indies with relatively minimal qualifications having left school at 15 or 16 and so on. So if you like, the composition, the population composition is very different. And another difference is religion. Religion is much more marginal, has been you know, from the start in Canadian multiculturalism than we've made it uh, central in Britain and Western Europe. And of course, it's mainly been Muslim activism and Muslim 
anger about various things and so on that have made it so. But so European multiculturalism works with religious groups in the way that Canada finds it even more difficult than we do. And the worst case is Quebec, where um, some of the intolerance for religious minorities, including Muslims, well, primarily Muslims, um, is actually as bad or not worse than what we would find anywhere in, in Western Europe. So yes, two cheers for Canadian multiculturalism, but there are things that we are doing which they are not, uh, they're failing to do or haven't been sufficiently challenged to do. Um, that, that, that's very, a very rich and much more nuanced view, I think, of, of the Canadian model than you, you usually get. Um, we're, we're moving towards the end, and so therefore I wonder if this might be a moment, because both books do pick up on um, positives as well as negatives and, and, and suggestions as well for, for, for things to improve and for how to improve them. So maybe uh, Alison, Matthew and Shuruk, perhaps you could address this, say a bit more about, about this pedagogy of hope, which is a, is a wonderful phrase. Um, by way of another question, which I'm sneaking in, uh, there's a fascinating moment, I think it comes in the introduction, but it, it, it recurs later, where you distinguish between the emphases, I think I'm right in saying, on, on how to improve between Muslim and non-Muslim respondents. And you say that the non-Muslims advocated things like greater intercultural literacy, but the Muslim students emphasised barriers and limitations. And so I don't know if that's a seed into the pedagogy of hope, or it, maybe it's an obstruction to the pedagogy of hope. But uh, I wonder if you could speak to that at all. Shall I start and then hand over to you, Matthew and Shiro? Okay, so pedagogy of hope. Yes, I think um, what was extraordinary and remarkable and very exciting was that we constantly found ourselves having conversations with participants, either in interviews or in focus groups, who, as I mentioned before, clearly had the skills and the understanding and the desire to improve the quality of campus life for everybody. But they felt somewhat restricted because they understood that they should watch their P's and Q's. Uh, this, the, there is, Matthew's quite right, there isn't actually a serious problem with freedom of speech on campus but there is enough of a problem to mean that people take care with how they express themselves. So the three points I mentioned um, earlier on that we recommend that there is support for the power to speak freely in discussion um, about difficult issues, because a lot of young people who spend so many hours online are filled with the opposite of the pedagogy of hope. They are, they are faced with despair, end of civilization type debates. And yet they know that the university could help them to resolve these issues. I think the other aspect of the pedagogy of hope, which I would emphasize before I go on to the other two points we recommend, is that it must be necessary, it must be possible to move away from the right-wing populist extremism of creating two polarities. You're either in or out, you're, in, you're either a yin or yang, you're either a snowflake or a, um, or a terrorist. We have to break away from that by accepting that if we start a difficult conversation, we may not be able to resolve anything, but it's still worth having. If we start a difficult conversation, we may come to understand each other better, but still realize they were a long way apart. In other words, the provisionality of interpersonal discourse is so crucial and it's not a black white polarity. It is much more muddled and that we should use the dialectical discourse approaches of continental philosophy, for example. So that's the first point about the power, support for the power to speak. The second point is that a lot of people quite chattily and quite casually pointed out, as I mentioned earlier on, that the oppor opportunities for being truly communal, for having conversation in well-lit areas, for having a conversation with somebody you don't know in um, a non-alcohol situation. These are these could very easily be facilitated. And we had 
frequent comments from people about, you know, literally, this is so awful. Before I came to university, I thought Muslims were terrorists. Now I'm sharing a room with a guy who's great. He's a Muslim, he happens to be a Muslim. And I now realize that I was completely wrong. So coming to university had transformed them, but they also recommended that this, this could be enhanced and um, rolled out more inclusively. And the third point we recommend is, which Shuruk can speak to with great expertise, is the, dis the need to expand Islamic studies, that there must be some coming together between Islamic experts from beyond the campus with those within and some emancipatory drive could easily be activated. There's plenty, there's fantastic expertise within Britain, which the continentals are quite jealous of. They realize we've got very strong models for Sunni and Shia higher education. We need to increase that potency. So would you like me to, to come in on, on that last point? Um, um, just to, to first to trace uh, back to what, uh, to, to trace what I'm going to say back to what Alison said about the pedagogy of hope. Uh, so in trying to conceptualize the idea of a pedagogy that is, um, that is configured by the different structures of the university and the different actors within the university and not just within the classroom. Uh, one of the things that seem to come through uh, our various encounters is that the hope is needed, uh, not just uh, for within the teaching uh, setting, uh, but also the learning that takes place uh, throughout the university uh, at, uh, in, in different uh, sectors of the university or different parts of it, uh, different uh, uh, layers of it. It's, um, it's one, of the, one of the things that the student I quoted earlier on when uh, I spoke, uh, when she had that hallelujah moment in the gender uh, and Arab women's writing class, is that uh, the pedagogy of hope here was shared with a teacher who was herself trying to create a knowledge that gives her agency. So the, within the uh, universities that where we've done qualitative research, we've often come across uh, the, the limits of uh, the pedagogy that was being practiced, especially with assumptions about the secularity of critique or the limitations of uh, religious commitments uh, in, in terms of being open to uh, forms of knowledge which challenge religious uh, affiliation or uh, identities. So these assumptions somehow, despite the fact that most of the module uh, um, module uh, material that we, we looked at had aims and purposes which highlighted criticality as a purpose. So uh, staff, staff often uh, taught that criticality is important, but we came across material and ideas and experiences in which the criticality seemed to have a limit and the limit in uh, often uh, comes with, uh, with encounters with religion and students with religious commitments. So a pedagogy of hope is necessary for a university where criticality seems to have uh, stalled or uh, to have become limited by uh, the secular assumption uh, by the way, by the ways in which we are doing criticality, but not reflexively thinking about how to push its frontiers. So these questions that are coming through uh, Muslim subjects and others, uh, it's not just about the, the, the academic freedom uh, or the ability to debate, but the ability to delve into the deeper structures which shape knowledge production and which shape the university as an idea itself. In this case, the idea of criticality. So a pedagogy of hope is one through which I see the horizon of the contemporary secular uh, university uh, in, uh, in the UK uh, could, be, uh, could be pushed toward more merging with forms of knowledge that could enrich the university. And going back to the final point that Alison has made, we have done research in two Muslim colleges of different uh, kinds of persuasions. 
And in these Muslim colleges, uh, the, uh, the, the richness of the past, the, uh, the past, the plurality of the uh, of Muslim uh, uh, of Muslim different Muslim regions, that plurality was preserved in the teaching, uh, in the um, in the traditions. Uh, some of the colleges actually spoke multiple languages and uh, came from different schools. Were not just so these were accredited colleges uh, with uh, an academic program. So uh, the possibility of enriching an Islamic studies on secular campuses uh, is actually lying there, but there, is, there are all these assumptions about religious commitment hindering uh, critical academic knowledge and hence the, the reluctance to merge and, and work and cooperate with these, uh, with these colleges. So a pedagogy of hope is, uh, goes beyond the classroom. It's, uh, it's something that um, actually cuts, it, you know, uh, cuts across uh, various questions, but it's the heart of the idea of the university and potentially also important for its future if the students are to uh, to continue to believe in the university. And just, I need to say this for my daughter's sake, who has contracted COVID and is locked down in a campus in Manchester and has asked me in the first week, does the university really care about knowledge or is this just a financial transaction? So, I couldn't answer that question. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Yes, that's a very good question, actually, to, to, to sort of end that part with. Matthew, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, just, just briefly, I mean, I, universities are, are, are very um, often idealized places. I mean, they're, 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 they're idealized by those who, who seek to attend them and are idealized by those who advocate for them. And, um, one of the one of the great things about this project has been able to explore in, in, in such empirical depth um, the ways in which, on the negative side, universities are complicit in broader patterns of prejudice and stereotyping. Um, on the positive side, though, it's really identified the the rich resources available in the communities on campuses across the country, and um, that universities have great potential to contest some of these misunderstandings and prejudices that we've that we've unearthed um, and just to echo something that Alison said a few minutes ago um, and it, it's kind of a methodological point really which is the the, the really striking uh, power of the focus group as a basis for conversation um, there were times then we we did several focus groups on every campus that we studied and often that involved it wasn't our intention to do this but we brought together people who'd never met before and who had conversations they wouldn't otherwise have had and who expressed an intention to continue having those conversations after we'd, we'd left and I think that really taught us a lot about um, good intentions and um, the great potential of uh, enriching conversations on campus across staff and students and across the country. Thank you. That's yes. That's that's the kind of partial answer to a question that's popped up now about um, whether uh, I think <clears throat> media outlets give a chance to kinds of moderate Islam to be introduced. Um, I mean, that's a separate question, I, I suppose. Um, but it does, it does raise that question and, and the point that you made actually very effectively there about the university still, when all said and done, with all its neoliberal pressures and, and everything, being a space where ideas can be discussed in a, in a more subtle and, uh, you know, less hot-headed manner than sometimes takes place within social media or the media in general with its, with its particular agendas. Uh, and with that in mind, Tariq, I wonder whether I could possibly, I don't know, invite you to start a political career um, by addressing something that you say right at the very start of, of, of your book, um, which is where you say, you talk about multiculturalism behind this so-called crisis of secularism. And you say, and this is a paraphrase, um, from uniformity of treatment to respect for difference, that move requires a rethinking of liberalism and liberal democratic institutions. So, as you're now a politician, what, what liberal democratic institutions 
could be reformed or would need to be reformed for your model to come into into being? Gosh, oh God, I, I had a, an answer already to join in about uh, hope um, because I once in a Guardian article talked about multiculturalism of hope and I was gonna talk about that. But reforming, um, it's easier for me to start with liberalism and then let's see where we get to with institutions. So of course, the liberalism can mean a lot of different things. Uh, <laughs> neoliberalism, for example, is one thing, but uh, in the United States, as we know, as we're watching their election, when they call someone a liberal, they mean they're kind of center left or someone like Bernie Sanders, who's called a, you know, a rabid liberal, is like what we might think of as a social democrat or something. So, um, but even within political theory and academic liberalism, there are lots of different, uh, different positions. The, the ones that I think are limiting in understanding multiculturalism and therefore also guiding politics are those that are overly focused on individuals. Because as I said in my account of multiculturalism, people have a sense of belonging to groups and they particularly have that sense, but not only, but particularly have that sense when they are collectively excluded or victimized or othered. And then they seek to have a more positive sense of who they are. And at that point, what, um, liberalism and liberal institutions need to do is to reach out to those groups and enable them to have more positive identities, which, you know, they'll have their own agency, perhaps their own, you know, political mobilization and so on. But nevertheless, they'll only be a small group. They'll need lots of political allies and they'll need space within um, the broader public, including the media outlets as one question uh, relates to. So I think that an acceptance of groups and group identity as part of um, ordinary democratic life, and, and that to, in many ways has happened. So liberalism has kind of shifted from a very individualist position to one that, for instance, is very concerned with um, marginalized groups like women or um, gay people and all the other varieties of sexual identities and so on. So, but as I said at the beginning, there is a particular stumbling block for a lot of people when the identities and the group identities are connected to a religious community because they say, ah, that is not how we do things here. That is not our tradition. So one of the things that I've been trying to do uh, in the idea of modern multi-secularism is to show that actually we do do these things. We're wrong to say we don't do them because we do actually do them. Our, our political life, our state is connected to the Church of England, to the monarchy, to the whole legacy of um, a certain kind of Christian ethics, Christian culture, which is also, of course, uh, reflected in some of our, our, our laws, not to mention simple things like that we don't have to work on Christmas Day, but we do have to work on the, on the Sabbath or, or at Eve or whatever. So I think one of the things I've been arguing is that Britain approximate less, approximates less to a liberal society, in quote marks, to a purist liberal society. And this is a jolly good thing because this is how minorities get included. Because if it was only about individuals, as they say, for instance, in Republican France, then they have a, uh, a justification, a legitimacy for wanting to dissolve groups because they say groups are, you know, commutaire, they are divisive, they don't respect the republic and so on. And of course, we've got that this week, you know, for reasons we understand. Um, so I've tried to show that multiculturalism isn't purely a liberal movement, and that's a good thing. And that Britain isn't a purely a liberal society. And that's a good thing, because these two things 
then can be bridged together. People who have a sense of their own collective identity are in a better position to include minorities who are struggling against othering and are struggling to get recognized for what matters to them, for their own uh, sense, whether it's a faith identity or a black identity or a sexual identity and so on. So I would say that the, the transformation, the gradual evolution of uh, liberalism into a more inclusive, group inclusive um, philosophy, if I can call it that, is good, but it's getting stuck at this point when the most important groups who want to be included, who have to be included, are religious identity groups. So I think that's the reform of secular institutions like the universities um, really need to embrace religious identity in the way that we've embraced gender identity and sexual identities. And at the moment, I don't know about other universities, I, I assume they're the same as Bristol University, we're making uh, very big public statements and actions in terms of embracing you know, the whole Black Lives mo uh, Movement. And so Black identities and the legacy of slavery and Bristol certainly has a, a big slavery story. Um, so I think we need to include uh, groups like Muslims in exactly the same kind of way. We mustn't exceptionalize and problematize religion in general or Islam and Muslims specifically. Thank you very much. Well, I mean, cause, cause for some optimism there, I think, in, in the end. And, and that's certainly true of both of these fantastic books. I see there are questions still coming in, but unfortunately we, we've run out of time. And I can, in, in this virtual world, I can still hear the thunder, thunderous applause that I'm sure is going on from, from everybody watching. Um, and so <clears throat> on their behalf and on mine, um, can I thank our panelists um, for a fantastic discussion and also for two more groundbreaking books, which will, will keep us talking and give us food for thought for a long time to come. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the thunderous applause. Thank you, everyone. Um, and um, hope to see you again uh, in the flesh as soon as possible. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Thank you Armina, for the Festival of Ideas. It's brilliant. Thank you, Armina. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.